Open your Bibles to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. What is the cause of the church's sufferings and difficulties? Is it totalitarian regimes? Fascist dictators? Discriminatory legal systems? What's the cause of the church's sufferings and difficulties? Revelation 12, which we looked at last time, gives us a deeper analysis of the perennial difficulties of the church. And we saw there the primary problem the church faces in every generation is the rage of Satan. Behind, above, underneath, all flesh and blood evil are spiritual forces. We are locked in a cosmic battle that is profoundly spiritual. That's the teaching of Revelation 12. Revelation 13, which is our text for today, provides us with more detail as to how Satan does this work. He operates commonly through two agents. Through these two agents, he carries out this wretched war on God's people. These two beasts, which we're going to look at, the beast from the sea, the beast from the land, are the dragon's henchmen and the means by which he inflicts his rage on Christians today. Now, I recognize that talking about the Antichrist on Valentine's Day is filled with dark irony, but I just wanted on the record to say to you, we all know, we all know that the candy companies and the greeting card companies have colluded together in a deep, dark conspiracy to sock us dry of our resources. <laughs> So this may not be far removed. <laughs> I've been waiting a long time for that. Um, Revelation 13. Revelation 13, let me read. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, and it had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horn, on each head a blasphemous name, the beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they, may, they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. 
Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. So we have two things to talk about. We've got two beasts. We've got two henchmen. And they represent the way in which Satan goes about his opposition to the church. Here's what we're looking at. We're looking at the authority of government and its leaders, the deception of false religion, and the way through it. Okay? The authority of government and its leaders, the deception of false religion, and the way through it. First, the authority of government and its leaders. The first satanic agent is the beast from the sea, and we'll see momentarily this represents the state, government, its leaders. Now, why is this beast portrayed as coming from the sea? For the Jewish people, a landlocked people, the sea was always agitated, restless, stirred up. It was a source of chaos and instability. It makes perfect sense to a Jewish mind that a beast would come from it. And it makes perfect sense that this beast would bring with it chaos and instability. And it would do so with authority as the ten horns and seven heads implies. But look at verse 2. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but it had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. This is an echo of Daniel 7, where four beasts are mentioned and refer to four consecutive kingdoms to come from Daniel's standpoint. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. This beast in Revelation 13, the beast from the sea, likely refers to Rome just as the fourth beast of Daniel's dream. And notice this empire of Rome is given its power and authority by who? The dragon, who is Satan. Yes, the Roman Empire was one of Satan's henchmen. Question, does it refer exclusively to Rome in the first century? Answer, no. Verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. That's the key We've looked at this 42 months times, times a half a time, right? 1260 days, three and a half months. It's all the same thing. Not primarily referring to a quantitative measurement, but to a qualitative state of affairs. This is the entirety of the church age. And it shows that this beast is, is every manifestation of evil in any government throughout history, also leading up to the final conflict at the end. Look up at verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. There's a a fatal wound, but it's healed. So think about the contradiction of that statement. How can a fatal wound heal? Well, if it's depicting manifestations of evil in governments throughout history, it's a way of saying Rome will one day fall, but another evil regime will rise to take its place. And that's going to be the story of human history. There will be this waxing and waning, this back and forth until the end. So the beast recurs. When a Hitler erupts or a Stalin erupts or a Pope Innocent III or an Idi Amin erupts, from a theological perspective, what you see is the concretizing in history of the power of Satan himself. Notice also from verse 4, people are constantly surprised at the survivability of it. It keeps coming back. Isn't that what many, many well-meaning people have said under various totalitarian regimes? What have they said? You can't fight the state. It's just too powerful. Well, you could fight it the way Bonhoeffer did, but he paid for it with his life. See, from the beginning of history, pagan and immoral states have sometimes risen in violent evil against God's people. And those pagan states eventually receive mighty death blows, blows from God, but the evil returns. We don't need to go any further than biblical history to see that. Pharaoh in Egypt, they rise, they fall. Mighty Assyria, Have you met any Assyrians recently? The empire was wiped out. All that remains today are a couple of tiny little villages. Babylon, Rome, Hitler. Will America survive if it squeezes God to the periphery? 
Now, the question may be raised whether this beast from the sea should be equated with the Antichrist. The answer is yes, if Antichrist is biblically understood. The term Antichrist is used only in the epistles of John, never in the book of Revelation. The Apostle John, the same one who wrote Revelation, writes in 1 John 2, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. And if John's in the last hour, what are we? We're in the last hour. And many Antichrists have come. Later on in chapter 4, he writes, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. So this spirit is exemplified in the beast from the sea, which was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. Look at verse 4. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? So notice the wonder people have in regards to this government and its leaders. Wonder. Awe. They seem to be intoxicated with its stature. They follow it. This verse almost has the language of discipleship. They've been trained by it. They wanted to be insiders to it. It's the language of worship. It's a notable fact of history that the most despicable tyrants have often been extremely popular and have elicited virtual worship from their people. Adolf Hitler set himself up as the Messiah for the Aryan race and was fanatically revered by many of the German people, even as their cities were being reduced to rubble by Allied advances. The relentless conqueror Napoleon Bonaparte continues to be adored by the French, despite having bled his country dry through his ruinous wars. Steve Wilmshurst puts it this way. He says, dictators create their own mythology, or others have it do it for them. Most of all, they demand people's unquestioning and unconditional submission, something only God has the right to. So the beast is seen when government takes the place of God in our lives. Vern Poitras notes that in democratic countries like our own, Satan wants people to look to the state as if it were a messiah. When the government is set forth as the remedy for all ills, economic, social, medical, moral, even spiritual, then the idolatry of the state usurps the place reserved for God alone. So whenever we sing the secular doxology, praise the state from whom all blessings flow, we are serving the beast. Verse 5 tells us proud words and blasphemies are the tools of the trade for this beast. At one level, this language of blasphemy is tied to the tendency of Roman emperors to take divine names on themselves, which inevitably would have been a great offense to genuine believers. Augustus was proclaimed divus, one of the gods, one like the gods. Nero was called savior of the world on his coins. The Roman Senate from Augustus on regularly declared the deceased emperors to be divine. Domitian, whom I think is the emperor on the throne during John's day, was addressed in Latin as Dominus e Deus Nostra, our Lord and God. How would Christians view that? The issue is actually larger than the vulgar blasphemy of Roman emperors. What does it mean to blaspheme God? The word itself means to slander God to slander his name, his dwelling place, those who live in heaven. Yeah, even attacks at God's people are put under the category of blasphemy. Now to slander his name isn't mere profanity, but it would include that. God's name represents all that he is represented in his name. 
It means anything you can do to make a joke about God or to cut him down to size or to make him just like you or to make him evil or to laugh at him. Anything that demeans him or depreciates him to make him just a loving fuddy-duddy old grandfather or to make him a horrific hater of people. That is to slander God because it is presenting a God other than the God who is there. Part of Satan's strategy to wage war against the church involves co-opting government, turning it into a beast that opposes the church and Christians. This is Satan's first henchman. The second henchman is the deception of false religion because we have another beast. Verses 11 to 18, we've got another beast. So we've got the dragon, The beast from the sea and the beast from the land. They're all in cahoots with one another. They form a sort of false trinity, a parody of the triune God. Now, why this contrast with a beast from both the land and the sea? We've already seen for land lovers like the Jews, the sea was symbolic for chaos and restlessness, upheaval. So a beast coming out of the sea carries with it that kind of overtone. But unless you live in California, the land normally signifies stability. The beast here comes in a way that does not seem to threaten. Innocuous. It's the very nature of stability. The land is supposed to be stable. Land is the platform for stability, which is the very foundation for all deception. In other words, this is peculiarly appropriate symbolism when the chief function of the second beast is to deceive This beast is the satanic inspired outworking of deception. And it takes place in concrete historical experiences through means that appear innocuous. There's an additional minute detail in verse 11 that further reveals the deceptive nature of this beast. It has the appearance of a lamb. Harmless. Jesus is a lamb. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, One quickly thinks of Jesus' words in Matthew 7. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. When I speak of false religion and deception as the primary tactic, I think we should lump into that any ideology that supports idolatry. Please make note of that. Any ideology that supports idolatry. So this is not just Islam or Buddhism. It's the hundreds of subtle ideologies that infest the way Americans see the world themselves and God. So on the one hand, this false religion is the communism of the Soviet Union with its spectacular parades through Red Square. It's the party card for the privileged. This false religion is Nazism with its Nuremberg rallies and its Hitler youth. It's the statues of Saddam Hussein which infested Iraq. It's the wall posters of Chairman Mao. We could add to this the biased media in America that covers up the horrors of abortion, ceaselessly promotes sexual immorality and misses no opportunity to heap scorn on Bible-believing Christianity. This false prophet combats the gospel with subtle philosophies and false religions that promote the cause of the beast and the dragon. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. The beast of the land represents pastors, college professors, politicians, songwriters, media pundits who cultivate a seductive message in order to gain a hearing for an ultimately satanic message. Notice, too, this beast is a wonder worker. In verses 13 and 14, New Testament scholar Craig Keener cites ancient church sources who tell of moving statues, fireball explosions, pagan magicians who could appear to make idols speak. Greg Beale writes that various pseudo-magical tricks, including ventriloquism, false lightning, and other such phenomena were effectively used in temples throughout John's day. 
Now, it's not so much what these people accomplished that's important to notice. It's what the accomplishment did to how the public viewed them. Notice the followership these things create in Revelation 13. Today, instead of cheap magic tricks, the advances of science and technology and the achievements of government are hailed as proof of the false gospel of secular humanism. Vern Poitras notes, technology becomes the worker of miraculous signs. Worship the power of the beast, the power of technocratic state organization, the power of the expert, because technology can work wonders like no one else. In our immediate cultural context, friends, we need to be wary of the so-called expert. There is an idolatry of science and the expert that has been running amok throughout the world this past year. Christian, don't be deceived by that. There's a reason this section of Revelation 13 ends with This calls for wisdom. I should say so. So these two beasts are in cahoots with one another such that Christians are killed because of their satanic cooperation. Now the point here is not that all Christians are slain under the influence of the second beast, but that worshipers of false religions will often display their zeal with violence against true believers. Let me say that again. Worshippers of false religions will often display their zeal with violence against true Christians. Then we come to this mark of the beast stuff. I thought about skipping it, but this is what everybody tunes into here, right? Revelation, mark of the beast. What do we make of it? Popular end times books describe the mark of the beast as something yet to appear, often a technology to implant a computer chip chip that will control commerce. There are abundant reasons to believe, however, that John is referring to a phenomenon common in his own day. The Greek word for mark is a term used for the emperor's seal on official documents. In this light, the mark of the beast alludes to the state's political and economic stamp of approval given only to those who go along with its demands. In the Roman world, slaves were sometimes tattooed on the forehead to mark their ownership. Similarly, the beast mark claims those who worship him as his property. Soldiers received marks on the hand to show their allegiance to a certain general. Likewise, the mark of the beast shows one's devotion as a follower. These examples show that the mark of the beast is not something one accidentally receives. Over the years in pastoral ministry, I've on occasion talked with people who seem to be paranoid about the fact that they may have it and not know it. I don't think so. I don't think so. This is not something you accidentally receive. Primarily, it's a formal acceptance of total allegiance to a person or earthly entity, rendering a devotion that only God deserves to receive. In America today, business people may sell their souls to the company out of lust for success. Some people fail to profess faith in Christ because of loyalty to family expectations. Some youths may wear tattoos of a street gang or a rock group that they religiously follow, swearing heart and soul to the gang or the band or the subculture. In John's day, the mark of the beast provided another way to persecute believers, verse 17. One of the churches John writes revelation to is in the city of Pergamum. It's well-attested Christians could not hold well-paying jobs there because the trade guilds required participation in idol worship and cultic prostitution. You don't join the club, you don't get the job. Christian businesses today may be closed down for refusing to fund abortion through insurance. Christian military officers may forfeit promotion because they refuse to hide their faith. 
The point is that the land beast paints Christians as being disloyal to the governing regime because of their higher allegiance to Christ. As a result, Christians are forced to the periphery of public life, unable to be elected to office or operate small businesses. And before I turn to our points of application, I need to say something about 666. Most commentators suppose that 666 is coded reference using an ancient practice known as gematria. Hebrew and Greek didn't have numbers, so they assigned numeric values to letters. Okay, got that? Now we're off and running, aren't we? You see where we're going? Yeah. Well, the idea here is that John is enabling us to identify the Antichrist through this means. There's a massive problem with that. Here are some options argued for. Ronald Wilson Reagan, Antichrist. Each of his three names is six letters. American statesman Henry Kissinger, long considered Antichrist candidate. Not only because of his labors for a secular world peace, but primarily because the letters of his last name add up to 666 in the Greek system. You all over lunch, and you can go home and calculate your own names. Make sure you're not... Uh... <laughs> the, problem, the problem is that by this approach, there's virtually no limit to Antichrist candidates. You see that, right? There's no limit. One commentator fancifully made a case for Barney, the ch children's television figure, since the words cute purple dinosaur yield the calculation of 666. I kid you not. That's in print. A better approach to unpacking this number is to understand the symbolism of six. We've encountered seven in Revelation as a number of completion and perfection. Six falls short. It's imperfect, incomplete, defective. More likely, it turns out the word beast in Greek calculates to 666. Interestingly, the name Jesus calculates to 888. If this was at least part of John's message, the meaning is pretty clear. Whereas Jesus possesses a superabundance of perfection, seven plus one, the beast falls short as a defective imposture, seven minus one. Now take a step back and look at the forest for a minute here. We're engaged in a cosmic war that's profoundly spiritual. The dragon ex exercises his rage against the church through two henchmen, government and its leaders, and false religion. How do these two beasts work? What are they after? Fear and deception. The beast from the sea is visible easily spotted. It's overt in its opposition to Christians. It's objective. Get you to be afraid of being a Christian, of living out your Christian faith, of practicing your Christian faith. Get you to be afraid to do that. Beast from the land insidious, clever, tricky. Get you to look at something and think, oh, that's good, and lure you in. The siren call, lure you in. There's nothing wrong with this. It looks good. And then you get inside and you realize something's amiss. Something's amiss. Primary tactics of Satan's henchmen, fear and deception. So what's our way through it? Let me mention a few of these. Way through it. View government with biblical appropriateness. View government with biblical appropriateness. On the one hand, it is God who has ordained the governing authorities. What is it that Jesus said to Pilate? You would have no authority if it wasn't for my Father in heaven. Who gave it to you? 
The Apostle Paul writing in Romans says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Repeated statements. He's trying to drive home a point here. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Where government behaves in ways that honor the Lord, let's be grateful for it. Let's contribute to it. In fact, it's good for us to play our part in contributing to government behavior that reflects the good as God has defined it. Folks, we need more Christians running for public office, not less. We need more Christians serving as judges and lawyers, not less. More who will incarnate their biblical worldview in these influential places of leadership. Christians are not meant to form monasteries squirreled away in nondescript enclaves. We need to maintain a faithful presence in society and in government. But we should always maintain an appropriate wariness of human government because God is telling us some governments will turn out to be beasts. In fact, I would add to that saying, totalitarianism, which demands conformity, is actually endemic to government because it's endemic to sinful nature. We need to be honest with ourselves. There is a part of every one of our hearts that demands to be king. Every one of us. There's a part of us that demands to be king and for the world to serve as our subjects. You put that nature in public office, there will always, always be a drift towards demanding conformity. Totalitarianism is endemic to government. Alexander Solzhenitsyn warned us of this. He warned us. He said, there always is this fallacious belief. What is that belief? What's that fallacious belief? It would not be the same here. Here, such things are impossible. This is what he says. And what does he go on to say? He says, alas, all the evil in the world can happen anywhere. Anywhere. View government with biblical appropriateness. Yes, God has ordained his place in the world. He puts leaders in their roles and there should be respect and appropriate submission to it. But we always have our eyes open. We always have our ears open. Because God's telling us government and its leaders can be beasts. Second, always prepare for suffering. Every day, prepare for suffering. Nobody gets to heaven on flowery beds of ease. Always prepare for suffering. The book of Revelation is working hard to shape our expectations. It's working hard. And it keeps driving at this. You gotta be ready. You gotta be ready. As we hold our profession of faith, we live out our faith in visible, practical, everyday ways, we will be opposed. Some of us may be jailed, others killed. Our suffering may begin economically, what, like what was transpiring in Pergamum. We might be excluded, unfairly taxed, unjustly paid, deliberately overlooked for that job. But Revelation is insistent that our victory is not won by dodging these things, but by patient endurance through these things. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. 
That's the image you gotta have. Third, constantly tune your powers of biblical discernment. Remember, Satan doesn't just use brute, easily spotted force or discrimination. That's one way, that's one henchman, that's one beast, but he's got another one. He's got another tool in his arsenal. He works through deception. Can you spot the counterfeit teaching? The worldview or ideology circling out there, can you parse it out with a biblical critique the Berean Christians in Acts 17 would be proud of? The only way to be able to do that, by the way, is through constant reading and immersion in the scriptures. There's simply no shortcut to tuned powers of discernment other than prolonged exposure to the truth of God's word. I was a bank teller for four years in college and uh, during my two weeks of training, my manager and uh, trainer uh, took me to, the, to a room and she slapped a bunch of cash down in front of me. She said, find the counterfeit bill. So I did, I tried, I tried really hard. I couldn't find the counterfeit bill. I could not figure it out. Some of these counterfeits, I mean, some are really bad counterfeits. Some are really good counterfeits. If I can speak of counterfeit money in that way, it's uh, some of those are really good counterfeit bills. And I was frustrated by it. And she said, don't worry about it. Here's what's going to happen. She said, you're going to handle copious amounts of cash every day. Your hands are going to be all over it. Your eyes are going to be all over it. Eventually, it's going to start to stick out to you. Then you run through the machine. You, know, you check, you confirm all this stuff. Yeah. And, and she was right. I mean, you handle just thousands and tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash in your hand. It's disgusting, I know. But, but um, you, you start to pick up on some things. This doesn't feel right. And you go to your coworker. What do you think? Yeah, let's run it through the machine. Let's check it. What we do on Sunday morning is handling the real thing. That's what Sunday morning's for. Sunday morning is for handling copious amounts of real cash. And the idea here is that you're able to leave and live Monday through Saturday, and because of your immersion and your copious handling of God's word, you're able to spot the counterfeits. That's the point of Sunday morning. And I hope it becomes second nature to you. But like there was a place to train me in handling counterfeit cash, studying counterfeit cash, looking at counterfeit cash, there is a place for Christians to do that as well. And I'm going to be doing that with you in the weeks, the months to come through a seminar entitled Understanding the Times. All the buzzwords you can think of that, that are saturating our world right now, we're going to go after this a little bit. Um, it's been baking for me, it's hard to tell, at least four and a half years since I got here, shortly after I arrived here. And um, it's time to talk about these things. LGBTQ, racial injustice, critical theory, oppression, victimhood, identity politics, cancel culture, woke. This is me. You do you. All these buzzwords. These are just labels that are the fruit of some roots most people are not aware of because the roots are invisible in our culture. I want to take you to the roots. And we're going to look at those things. Okay. Uh, for now, I've got two offerings available. Somebody asked me in the first service, you have to go to both. No, they're the same. They're the same. They're just options, okay? One option is on Saturday, March uh, 27th, 9 a.m. to noon, here at the church. We'll be in the lobby. And the other one is Saturday, April 17th, 9 a.m. to noon, and our fantastic Kingdom Kids staff is offering child care for fifth grade and under at the uh, seminar on April 17th, okay? Space is limited. Registration is required. Registration opens today at noon. <laughs> I thought you'd find that funny. I don't want any, listen, I don't want any phones or watches going off in 13 minutes, okay? Make sure all that's muted and silenced, okay? Uh, if, if need be, I'll uh, add more. If these fill up, I'll add more. There's a true story about one man who became wise to the false religion of the land beast. And his name was Boris Kornfeld. Uh, he was a doctor who worked in the labor camp operated by the Soviet Union. 
Somehow he had gotten in proximity with a Christian. This Christian had told him the gospel and Kornfeld was convicted of his sin, big time. And uh, it was shortly after that that he turned to faith in Jesus Christ. But for a great amount of time, he didn't tell anybody for obvious reasons. He didn't tell anybody. Yet his, his new allegiance to Jesus required him to engage in um, opposition to the corruption that was handling, happening around him. He just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, so he was doing what he could to protect the weak and the afflicted, to live out his newfound faith. Well, one night, Kornfeld was helping a patient who was recovering from a painful cancer operation. And he decided that he would no longer be kept silent by fear of the communist authorities. And so the words just spill out of his mouth. And he told his story about coming to faith in Christ and how God's grace had changed him. After bearing this testimony, he put the patient to bed for the night. Kornfeld went to his nearby room. And while he slept, he was attacked. His skull was crushed by a hammer blow. And he died for refusing to serve the beast any longer. Did Kornfeld's witness matter at all? Was his commitment to Christ worth losing his life? The answer is given by the patient who heard his last words. The patient's name, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn later wrote, Kornfeld's prophetic words were his last words on earth and directed to me, they lay upon me as an inheritance. Many have argued, and I think rightly, the writings of Solzhenitsyn made significant contributions to the fall of communism in the Soviet Union. The wisdom is not how to strike back at the beast with his own weapons. That's not wisdom. But how to boldly declare the gospel message of Christ. The wisdom is not how to evade the beast's tyranny, but how to persevere in Christian courage and commitment in the face of it. We can, friends, we can live without fear of his assault. We can. Because his hammer blows can do nothing but send you into the loving arms of Jesus. Is there a loss there? I don't see any. Last, trust the one controlling the unfolding story. Trust the one controlling the unfolding story. 24 times in Revelation, the word edathe is used. <clears throat> it's the word it was given. It was given, 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 it was given. And we kind of just kind of blow through that. We don't really think about, well, who? Who is the one giving? It's a divine passive. It's God who's doing the giving. It is so brilliantly written, friends. John could have said, God gave to such and such the authority to do this. God said to, God gave to. It's not out there like that. You know why? Because life's not like that. You look at your life, you look at the world, and you raise your hands, you say, where is God? Exactly. It's exactly the way we read Revelation. It was given, it was given. Where is God? Where is God? And all the while, John is trying to get you to see, look underneath. Look underneath it. Who do you think? It may not be plain as day. It may not be plain as day. But there is an edothe behind every action occurring in this country, in this world. It was given. Do you realize what that means? If God and the Lamb are on the throne and have already won, do you know what this means? The fight has been rigged. The fight has been rigged. And it's been rigged in your favor. So don't run from those threats. Don't run from the dangers. Press into them. Because you know, who, you know the one who's rigged the fight. If you're a new creation in Christ, the worst thing that happens to you, you end up in the arms of Jesus. Sounds pretty good to me.
The fight's been rigged. Let's pray. We thank you for your word again, Lord. It's, it's light. It shows us things. It makes us aware of things we weren't previously aware of. It, it helps us to see things that ordinarily we just don't see. Lots of things that your word's telling us here today. Lord, make us aware of the fact that our enemy, the dragon, is working to incite fear in your church and is working to lure us in through the tactic of deception. So God, I pray that you give us eyes to be able to spot those things. And Lord, be able to move forward with courage and wisdom being given full assurance of victory. The fight's been rigged. You're the one calling the shots. You're the one calling the shots. Nothing is out of control. You are in control. And you're moving human history to this beautiful day where your people will be united with your son, Jesus, and we will stand in triumph. We thank you for that. We worship you for it now. In Christ's name, amen.